Welcome, everyone. We're very excited for this uh, lunchtime edition of Product People Community Events. We are here with uh, David, or DHH. He's the founder of Basecamp, Hey, and also creator of Ruby on Rails. And before we start, short intro of about myself. I'm the founder of Product People. We're product management uh, consultancy and also the curator of Germany's largest product management community. Um, and I've been doing product for about 10 years in um, individual contributor as well as people manager roles um, in a few companies. So what we do is help companies discover and deliver great products faster. We empower our product management community to share knowledge generously through events like this. Um, and the way we make money is doing the hands-on agglomerous work of a product manager on an interim basis. We onboard fast aligned teams and deliver outcomes. Uh, some of our use cases are fast growth after a funding round, um, parental uh, leaves, or a slower hiring uh, cycle, which is usually um, three to nine months in Europe. And, and then the others would be a temporary initiative or appraisal or overhaul of the product uh, team and processes. Um, most of our clients are European companies, like Zalando, Tears, Call24, uh, Omeo, and others. And we are very compatible and looking to work with uh, companies that are very customer and product centric. And so this is very our very diverse and colorful team. We're distributed across Europe and of course looking to hire more product managers. And over to the our guest. Um, so this edition, as you're usually uh, accustomed with someone having a talk, this time we will take questions from the crowd. So you can write your questions on YouTube or LinkedIn or wherever you're um, joining us from, and as well as on Slido, and we will be taking over a few of those. Uh, so someone is saying you hear echo. Is this the case for others? Let me know if I should change my mic. No? All right. But thank you, Javier, for all right, uh, pointing this out. All right. So I'll start with one which I was talking with uh, David earlier. I'm a big fan of his uh, writing. And, and he was saying that he actually got criticized for writing too much. Uh, and we discovered that we both read Matt Levine um, with his newsletter published via Bloomberg called Money Stuff. Who else would you recommend, David, for, um, and are a fan of be before we go into the, let's say, product or tech related questions? Sure. Well, um, the first thing is uh, I, I get actually the majority of my analysis and long form writing as newsletters. It's been one of those wonderful resurgences we've seen over the last few years that a lot of writers have switched from um, all sorts of different platforms to email. And I, of course, uh, we make hey, an email product. I'm a huge fan of email. It is, in my opinion, one of the true killer apps of the internet. Um, so to be able to get all of that writing in form of email is wonderful. Um, much of the writing that I consume on newsletters is commentary and analysis on world, but mostly US politics. So my recommendations kind of fall in that category as well. Um, I'm a big fan of uh, Matt Taibbi. Uh, Glenn Greenwald, both are two writers that use Substack. Uh, Glenn Lowry is also on Substack. Substack has really emerged as perhaps the premier platform for writers who are looking to get paid uh, in, in this kind of uh, way. Um, I write my own newsletter on something called Hey World, which is at world.hey.com slash DHH. Um, and I think uh, Left Sets is uh, another very long-term uh, writer I've followed for many years. He writes about the music industry predominantly, but also U.S. Uh, culture and politics. And all of these writers, are, are, including Matt Levine, are people who've inspired my own writing style and approach to writing. Um, and also kind of, 
I don't know, um, drawn me into this world of writing in a more personal way. I mean, I've been writing on the internet for 20 years in a various forms of blogs and, and so forth. And a lot of that has been on like company blogs. We had a, a popular blog for many years called Signal versus Noise that the company put out. But the fact of writing a newsletter allows me at least a sense of writing in a more personal way, that this is a human communicating directly to another human, as you would if you were sitting down and having a conversation about interesting topics. Um, so really love that part about writing. I encourage everyone to check out Substack and all of the wonderful newsletters in general as a way of consuming uh, information in a way that's not just on this endless feed. One of the things I've really come to dislike about Twitter and other social media platforms is that you're never done. Newsletters, you're done. Like when you read the five things you subscribe to, it's finished, it's over, and you can get on and do something else. So, cool. Thank you so much for that. Um, I will also add a bit of praise until uh, you get the new, uh, next question. Till Carson says, Thanks for Rail 7. And um, Dmitry Gorshkov likes your new hairstyle. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, this is the Corona hairstyle that uh, emerged all by itself by simply not going to uh, a hairdresser for, for a long time. And then it kind of just stuck. <laughs> Very cool. Thank you for this. Um, all right, so I'll, I'll take a few questions via Slido. Um, Mansoor, feel free to republish this link in case people didn't... Uh, see it yet. Um, Anonymous says, in a recent blog post you wrote about principles, what are non-negotiable principles you applied at Basecamp and Hey? Yeah, so I think that's a good question. We were just talking internally recently about why don't we have a mission statement at Basecamp? There's a lot of companies who try to sort of narrow it down and say like, we're just about these eight things or we're just about these 10 things and that's our core principles and they drive everything. I don't, I have a hard time to boil it down like that. And um, perhaps because we do write as much and we think about having a opinion or, or, or a take on so many different things that boiling it down to just a core set of principles is, is quite difficult. Um, we've written four books and all of these books are, they're short, but all the points are short too. So Rework, for example, our most popular book that sold more than half a million copies has 86 essays, which are all essentially a form of principles. Um, so to just boil it down to like a handful is difficult, but I, I, I pick out just one. Um, one thing that has been sort of a thread going through the 20 years that Jason and I have been running Basecamp and, uh, and the business together is this notion of independence. That having um, and being in a position of independence is both incredibly liberating. It allows us to talk about things in a authentic way where we don't shy away from difficult topics, uh, provocative topics, and hopefully novel and enlightening topics, because we don't have to kind of dress it down or dumb it down or flatten it to appeal to either the widest amount of people you can imagine, or to be careful about pissing off some bosses that we might have, whether those bosses are actual bosses or a board or venture capitalists or someone else who kind of eats a slice of your independence pie. And that level of independence, I think we've really taken upon us as almost an obligation. At Basecamp, we should do things that only we can do because we have this level of independence. Um, that has manifested itself in, in a variety of different ways. But when we launched Tay.com, for example, and Apple showed up uh, two days after we launched and said, hey, We'd like 30% of your revenues if you want to stay on the app store. Um, that felt like one of those moments where we could take a, an unreasonable amount of risk to confront this issue of antitrust, confront this issue of big tech by taking a very large public and high stakes battle with Apple, where if we had been a company of lesser independence, if we had had venture capitalists or we'd had a board or we had individual investors um, or we were very small, we probably wouldn't have dared 
because it is difficult to take that kind of um, decision to go up against the most valuable company in the world and risk a product that you had just spent two years and millions of dollars developing on the basis of principles. Because when Apple showed up, for example, and said, hey, we'd like 30% of your revenues, the easiest thing would simply have been to roll over and say, sure, how would you like to get paid? Um, <laughs> But we didn't do that, right? We, we, we stuck to our guns and we fought for what we believed. And I think that uh, has had a tendency to work out for us over the years, not always equally so. And sometimes it does come back to, to hit you in the, in the head. I think that's one of the reasons why lots of business people don't sort of always say what they think or, or do what they feel is right because they have other considerations and things that they're afraid of will happen. And those things do happen occasionally. Um, but yes, this principle of, of independence and the obligation to follow through on that independence and to do things that only we can do because of that independence is perhaps the number one value and principle we hold dear at base camp. Thank you so much. And as a follow-up on this, as I saw, it was also submitted to Slido. Um, how can we as product manager contribute to push on building more responsible products and against this type of agenda? Yeah, I think it's, um, it's often difficult. I think um, product management is often a discipline that's squeezed in between all sorts of other priorities where good people will end up doing work that they're perhaps not eternally proud of because they have certain pressures from the business, from um, the stakeholders that are pushing them in directions that they know isn't right. You think often uh, an example that's been pulled out a lot over the years is you think of, of, of how things have gone down at Facebook, for example. Like at every step of the way, when these um, social media platforms were being tinkered with and created and the algorithms were tuned for maximum engagement and enragement, there were product managers at every step of the way. And I'm sure that those product managers for the vast majority of these case are kind, caring people who want to do what's right in the world. But then suddenly you have the pressures of, uh, KPIs and quarterly targets and the mechanics of capitalism takes on a life of its own. And all of a sudden you are the person who you would have hated to be a year ago. And you still simply have to get up and do your job. And I find that that is, is in many ways, I, I almost have respect for the capacity of the cognitive dissonance that you have to keep inside your head to be in a role like that, because I know I'm just personally utterly unsuited to, to be pressured in those ways. And perhaps this is one of the reasons why I, I knew early on in my career that I would make a very poor employee um, because I simply couldn't keep my mouth shut and I couldn't march to a set of orders that were being put out if I didn't truly believe in them. So I, I think it is really difficult, but there are ways where we can sort of try and advocate and pull and nudge in the right direction. Um, and I also think there are ways where, especially in a very strong job market, you can accept at some point, you know what, I... I I can't do it. Like I've tried, I've given it a good go, but I can't pull the organization in the ethical uh, direction that I'm trying to, to get it to. Um, I'm going to go work, work somewhere else. But um, I think this is one of the things where perhaps uh, previously I was more hardcore in that. And I've, I've, I've softened up in the idea that like, well, you could just quit your job. Well, that's easy to say in a lot of circumstances. Um, well, where, where else are you going to go? So you hop from Facebook to Twitter. Did life get any better? Did it get any more ethical? Are you working on anything that's furthering of, of humankind? Eh, I don't know. Maybe not. Um, it's not actually always that easy to do. Um, <clears throat> but I think having some set of personal principles that you believe in and then cherry picking the ones that can actually make a difference at work um, Everyone can have these small acts of rebellion to kind of pull the organization in the direction they hope for it to go. Um, but um, yeah, I, I wish I had stronger, more encouraging, more inspiring advice. But I think the, the fact is that in the face of many large organizations, the individual is just an individual. 
And if that person is no longer there, then someone else will be and, and life carries on. That's both a, a blessing and a curse, but uh, yeah. Thank you for that. Uh, so I'll take a question on privacy because I think it ties in on this. And then I see we have a few questions about remote work as, as you've been writing about this extensively. Um, so I'll take uh, Gabriel's uh, question on the specialists and decision makers are trying to make privacy a concern. What would it take to change the public approach to privacy first products? Gabriel is also in the Zoom call. So if you feel like you need more context, you can unmute. Yeah, I think that's a great question. I think it's just one of those questions that has been really exciting to me because things have actually changed. Um, I've cared deeply about privacy my entire career, uh, militantly so on everything from encryption to, to what have you, to tracking, to spy pixels, to many of the things that we do at Basecamp and the products that we create um, are infused with this attention to privacy and this um, fight for greater privacy. And what I've observed in my time is that there's sort of like a before and after. And the before and after revolves around the passing of the GDPR. That this is one of those few moments in tech history where legislation actually changes the directory or the direction of the industry, at least on, on one side of the Atlantic. And today we have a whole category of companies that are born with a native appreciation for privacy because of the GDPR, because that is the law of the land in Europe. And it's a really interesting uh, AB experiment because the GDPR only governs Europeans. It does not govern Americans, even though there are American um, legislators that are looking to the GDPR for inspiration. Broadly speaking, Europeans get the protect projection of the GDPR. And that means that all of these native uh, companies that are born out of the GDPR, they're all European. I, uh, one example that I often look to is Plausible.io. Plausible.io is an alternative to Google Analytics, and it's born from this native understanding of the GDPR. We do not track individual use of data. Um, we aggregate things in a way that preserves that privacy. Therefore, we get to route around the requirements for consent and cookie banners and all the sort of perhaps less effective or, or meaningful legislation that's also been passed in Europe. I think that's also fair to point out that the precursor to the GDPR, this idea of the cookie banners has in some ways become a scourge and has not actually solved or fixed anything versus the GDPR core principles are actually strong and good and humanistic in this um, sense that can be woven into the DNA of a company and plausible that iOS an example of this where I think it's the kind of company that could only come out of Europe. You wouldn't see that um, from the US first. You look at all the US alternatives and they're all like, what do you mean privacy? Let's gather every piece of data we possibly can, store it all forever and cross-reference it 25 times from, from here until we know everything about everyone all the time. And you go like, it, this is not the internet that I want to be part of. Um, so I think that's been a really interesting uh, note. And it's also provided cover. If you are now a company operating in Europe and you care about privacy, it's never been easier because the GDPR sort of sits there on the side, constantly providing uh, at least an ideological backing for your push. Oh no, we can't actually do this. We can't just collect a bunch of email addresses and start sending people email unless we have informed consent. That it's enriched this um, vocabulary we have around privacy by giving us some core terms that um, product managers and other people work on product can invoke. And it has the strength of not just their opinion, but the letter of the law. And I think that that is sort of the idealized state of how legislation can actually help and advance technology. It's very often not what happens. Very often legislation kind of misses the mark. I think the cookie uh, banner requirements is one example of that, where we just end up annoying everyone and actually not making anything more secure and more private. Um, but the GDPR core principles, informed consent, defining what that means in terms that almost read like a charter of freedoms of rights or, or human rights uh, declaration is really powerful because I think it gives us something more than just laws. It gives us 
ambitions and aspirations that we're not just doing this because the law says something, we're doing this because it's right and it's good. Um, and I think that that level of, of kind of infusement of, of there's a reason why so many uh, countries have these um, sort of strong debates about the constitution because once you lay down some core principles and you really bake them into the foundation of a society and of a country, they invoke a certain sense of pride. They say, this is who we are. And this is when I think of, of European tech scene, this is one of the things I'm most proud of, that the European tech scene is starting to diverge. It's not just a poor, cheap copy of Silicon Valley. No, it's a set of companies trying to do something else fundamentally different. I don't want a cheap copy of Twitter or Facebook or Amazon. That would be the worst outcome for the European tech scene, in my opinion, is that we just get these pale copies. We need completely different visions. And the GDPR for me is one of those cornerstones of, of that alternative universe where Europe goes first and then hopefully America and the rest of the world is the one that follows along. Very cool and inspiring. Thank you so much. Gabriel seems to have a follow-up to that. Your yes, because, thanks a lot for that. It was really interesting and inspiring. Uh, it was also, uh, you, you, you preach to the choir, right? I mean, uh, that's why I made, I made two parts in my question. The first, first part was specifically about, we know that the specialists, people who care and the decision makers with the GDPR and our California as well, they, they changed cap. So they are, they are aware of this. My, my question is specifically, how do you bring that? Everything you told me, everything you told us, how do you bring that and preach to the rest of the world? How do you evangelize that to the public? How do you make sure everyone believes and, and, and follows that? Yeah, I, I think that's a great question that you can have these high minded, high concept ideals and you can be personally inspired by them. And then you can see like no one else seems to give a damn. Um, I think the way to make people give a damn is to create products in that spirit, in that DNA, and make those products damn great. This is why I use Plausible as an example. Plausible is not just a more privacy-oriented version of Google Analytics. It's a better version of Google Analytics. So it competes not just like handicap with one hand behind its back in terms of what it can do. It does better. And I think nothing moves hearts and minds like simply showing people what these principles and ideals can amount to in a practical sense that makes a real difference to someone's lives and inspires them in turn, right? I look at the approach that Plausible has taken on how they deal with data. And I think, you know what? That gives me ideas. <clears throat> how should we manage things? Uh, how should we um, build our own internal system? Should we build them in that same spirit? And I think that this is the... Uh, amazing power of role models is that they light that sort of idea in someone's head that, do you know what, maybe we could do this too. And I think that this is, um, this is what we need more of. We need um, all of these new companies coming out of Europe in particular to embrace these European values of privacy and, and human rights in the broader context um, and just make something that's the best. No, no more excuses, no more apologies. We have everything we need in Europe to create the kinds of products that would be the envy of the world anywhere. Um, and does not have to, to say like, oh, well, it's because like we got started later or whatever. Embrace the fact that Europe was late to some extent, which means that you don't have to repeat all the same mistakes. You get to look at the internet culture that developed in the US and say, oh, there's some fine, great ideas, but there were also a lot of wrong turns. And we can take some different turns and we can come out with different kinds of products that feel natively European in a sense that is, is all those positive things about it. And I say, I mean, obviously I have a great affiliation for Europe in general, but, but it's even more local than that too. I think to some extent we've oversold the value that the internet is kind of just this global community as though that makes us all kind of just citizens of the world, which is a term I've actually used about myself in the past, but I, that I feel less and less 
an affiliation with, that we should not just be citizens of the world. We are citizens of a given place. And that that given place informs our opinions and approaches to everything, including product development. And we should lean on that. When I think of the Danish companies that I'm particularly proud of, um, everything from Bang of Olufsen to Lego, I can see sort of these facets and strains of Danish culture. And I go like, do you know what? The world is more interesting when out of the 186 countries around the world, we embrace those differences and we meet in on the internet from, from that vantage point that we don't all just create the same look, feel, approach and set of values that, that govern everything. Um, that focusing on the local aspects and embracing those and being proud of them um, enriches everyone. That the trade is more interesting when uh, Denmark produces Danish products and Germany produces German products and the US produces American products. And then we kind of enrich that, right? I think technology used to have that feel. I remember um, <clears throat> sort of in the 80s, you'd be talking about like, oh, there was like Japanese technology. And that was a sort of a particular kind with a particular aesthetic. Um, or or uh, you'd go in, in the early days to um, Shenzhen or, or some other place and you'd feel like it has a, a, a local vibe that is different and interesting. I think these days we've become more and more accustomed to the fact that there are these global platforms. Um, we talked about Facebook and Twitter, like Facebook and Twitter is Facebook and Twitter around the globe. And that's a bug, not a feature. Um, I'd rather we had a hundred Facebooks. I mean, not literally, I think actually Facebook is, is, is not actually a great model to follow. But this idea that we had local platforms and we had local products um, and less of it had these, this sense of scale. This is the other thing that comes with the internet, that there is essentially no friction to scale. Um, one American tech company could come to dominate the world in about five minutes. And we look at that with awe and say like, oh, isn't it wonderful? Um, the internet breaks down borders. And, and you know what? I've come to, to see the flip side of that and go like, I don't think it's actually as wonderful as we've perceived it to be. And I think we're in a great realignment right now. Some of that realignment is being provoked by things that aren't as um, nice and cuddly and, and cheery, like um, uh, the Great Firewall in China or, or India shutting its um, internet uh, um, sort of more inclusive. But I, I think there's also something to look at that and go, do you know what? Um, the reasons for the Great Firewall aren't great. Um, they're not these humanistic, uh, open, uh, happy-go-lucky values that we just talked about. But it kind of worked, as in China actually has a local strong uh, tech scene with uh, platforms that are under sovereign control. And you say, when you say sovereign, I mean, halfway single party dictatorship sovereign is perhaps not the greatest way of being under control. But you could recontextualize that and say, if we in Europe had sovereign control over the likes of the great media platforms from YouTube to Twitter to Facebook, wouldn't we be better off? I think we would. I look at the, the Danish political um, culture and, and ecosystem, and I, I think it's a travesty that, that our national conversation is happening on these global platforms that are all born out of Silicon Valley ethics. And I go like, that's not great. So anyway, now we really got far away from the original question. Sorry. All right. I don't think so. So at least from what I'm reading also on, on the threads, people are super excited and they're saying this, they're loving the talk so far. Um, and I, I think this is also interesting for the, our community, which, which are product managers. And at some point, a lot of decisions end up being principal decisions or how do we envision this to be? Because um, then you can just go ahead and apply a playbook to optimize conversion or any other KPI you're looking at, right? So I, I think this is very exciting. Um, so I I will jump to one question. Um, you have a fan of your speech from Rails Conference 2019, where you spoke about free and open source software and the tragedy of the commons. Absolutely great principle. So while, um, what is the shift that you see in the FOSS community thinking since then? Yeah, so what I've actually seen is almost like a fracture in the FOSS community in terms of the values that um, <clears throat> kind of are struggling to 
to make themselves the predominant ones. One strain in the FOSS community is that open source software is currently a tragedy of the commons because there's not enough um, money being paid to individual contributors. And there's a lot of companies who are benefiting from this open source software. And there's an impending catastrophe just around the corner if we don't rectify this problem. Um, first of all, I think that analysis is, is simply wrong. It's been proven wrong by history. There's no catastrophe around the corner. You look at some of the high profile uh, issues that's been in, in um, open source software and you go like, oh yeah, I mean, that was great. The la la latest thing with this uh, Java logging framework, um, uh, what was it, j for loggers or something like that, that created a lot of maintenance burden for a lot of people in a lot of places because it was embedded in a, in a bunch of places, um, was not a consequence of kind of sort of starvation work that, oh, we didn't have the money to do this. Um, you compare that to the daily list of critical security bugs that are constantly being discovered in the software from the most powerful and richest organizations on earth, from Microsoft to, to Apple, to Google and so forth, there's a steady stream of uh, security issues. Uh, this is simply, I think, a false pretext to push a narrative that um, open source um, needs to operate within the same capitalist dynamics as everything else. And we should look at it as, a, as this tragic commons that's being neglected. I have a different view on that. Um, and, and that view is that the appeal of open source to me is exactly because it does not operate within the normal capitalist dynamics. I get enough of the capitalist dynamics on a daily basis running a product company that is very much a capitalist company. And I enjoy that in, in many ways. And, and I think the world has much to be thankful for, for this basic uh, version of capitalism. It also has many things to criticize about that world. But either way, um, having a space that is disconnected from the ethics and the principles of that world is like a refuge, at least to me. And when I work on open source, I don't work on it on capitalist terms. I work on it as a form of self-actualization and interest and productivity and creativity and things I just want to put out in the world, not because we're making transactions that I am giving you something and then you owe me something back. No, quite the contrary, that I am putting gifts out into this world with a little uh, sticker on the side that says, enjoy this very much, but if you have problems, those are your problems. Do take care of them. They're not necessarily my problems. It doesn't mean we can't collaborate on solving them if I find them interesting too, but I don't owe you anything. Um, and I think that that is just such a relief when you're used to being, as I am, otherwise a product person who sells services to customers where I do owe those customers something. When a customer signs up for Basecamp or Hey, I do have obligations I need to fulfill to those customers. And sometimes that's great and they're great customers. And other times it's less great and they're kind of uh, less great customers, so to speak. They're, they're not necessarily always polite and kind and caring about the other side of the equation, but I accept that that is simply the nature of the capitalist exchange. When it comes to this open source world, I don't have to accept that. We can redefine things in different ways. So that's my take. I, I like the separation between these worlds. Um, I fully accept, of course, that there can be other reasons why people want to do open source and some people want to find their livelihood in open source and some of them do and some of them don't. And the ones who really want to find their livelihood in open source but can't sometimes end up uh, uh, a little bitter about that. And I think we just need to make sure we weigh their input to the discussion accordingly. All right, thank you so much. Uh, so I'll move to uh, remote work and, and then people have a few questions about Basecamp and Hey as products. Um, so what on remote, what's your take on balancing remote work and uh, maintaining good team bonds without making team activities excessive or too demanding? Yeah, so it's kind of interesting. I mean, 
we've been a remote company since inception. So for 20 plus years, I've worked remotely together with Jason and, and the other people at Basecamp. So for us, um, this was just life and has been life for two decades. So it was kind of interesting when in 2020, it became life and reality for everyone all at once. Um, almost to the point that like, I had to remind myself of like, oh yeah, there are still people who work in offices and they go to meetings in person all the time. And that's fascinating. I guess people can still work like that. So I was looking at it from sort of the other perspective where a lot of people showed up bemused. Oh, you mean we can create a company that continues to function if we work remotely? Yeah, yeah, you can. In fact, um, Jason and I wrote a book about this all the way back in 2013 called Remote Office Not Required, where we kind of did the full analysis on both why you should look at remote work as an option, and then secondly, how to do it well. Because I think this has been one of the challenging parts of the pandemic, and there's been many challenging parts, but one of them has been, okay, so we all have to do remote. Um, that just means we have to install Zoom and Slack, right? That's how you do remote. You just install <laughs> Zoom and Slack, and then and you carry on as you were and fill your day with Zoom meetings. And, oh, what happens two weeks later? You absolutely hate your life. Oh, that's curious. Um, yeah, that doesn't work. There are other ways of, of doing remote. And this is some of the things that we've been preaching for so long that um, there are specific tools that are, are well sort of meant for that. But there's also ways of working that are quite different. Making the transition, for example, from having a synchronous collaboration culture where most collaboration happens around meetings that have to be attended I uh, well previously in person and now on zoom and this is where you make decisions and this is where you make status updates and this is where you uh, communicate new initiatives and all this other stuff that you reach for the meeting as the first tool of collaboration um, that is, in my opinion, a miserable way of running any organization, but a particularly miserable way of running a remote organization and making the transition from that synchronous uh, way of working to an asynchronous way of working, where the first tool of collaboration is writing and writing that can be read two hours later or the next day and responded to asynchronously is a huge shift to, to, to make. Now, in terms of the culture to make it sort of feel and fit with that, I think that is a difficult thing. And, and we've just been exposed to the most difficult circumstances you could imagine, that not only were we forced to work remotely, we were also forced to work remotely in more or less complete isolation. That is, in my opinion, a grand experiment in a form of microdosing of torture, because uh, there's a reason why um, strict isolation as a method of, of uh, engagement is prohibited um, and, and, and sort of deemed as torture when it happens in other carceral uh, contexts, because humans are social creatures. And if you just put them in kind of their little box and force them to be by themselves day in and day out, um, they don't do well. They don't respond well to that. So all of our shared experience through this pandemic has been so heavily tainted by the fact that we were doing remote work while in isolation. When that's actually not, that's not the kind of remote work I've been doing. I've not been living in isolation for 20 years. Um, I've had the opportunity to mix that remote collaboration with people who, who work around the world with seeing a bunch of people all the time in the flesh. Um, and I think that makes all the difference in, in the world. So I think when you look at this, of like, how is it hard to build culture and so on? You, you shouldn't look at this at, at a, as a dichotomy between like, well, it's either remote or it's in person. It's both. In fact, just next week, all of Basecamp is meeting up in Miami for the first time in two and a half years, but hopefully now getting back on our regular schedule where we will be meeting each other every six months in person. That this is the perhaps insight or breakthrough in terms of remote uh, collaboration is that you realize that meeting and seeing each other face to face is incredibly important. It just doesn't have to happen every day or every week or even every month. 
that just having a chance to see and work and spend time and share meals with your coworkers once every six months is actually in many cases enough to provide that sort of strengthening of our fundamental human bonds. And then it's much easier after that um, to work together remotely. Now, <clears throat> even remotely, there's a, a million tactics you can you can use as well to sort of maintain those bonds um, and make sure that they don't decay too much between meeting up in person. We write about a bunch of it in, in Remote Office Not Required. It's a, a great little book you can read in about two and a half hours that has a lot of this stuff on it. Um, and then, of course, we build Basecamp for exactly this purpose. Um, Basecamp is the place where Basecamp spends all its time being Basecamp. And we built the entire product around this idea of uh, accommodating and encouraging and soothing and smoothing a remote organization with tools like uh, automated check-ins. So for example, we have um, a whole array of questions that Basecamp asks everyone who works at Basecamp uh, every day or every week, like, what have you worked on today? That's the replacement for status updates. So people simply write it down and now you can keep a pulse and an energy on 50 people, not just the five people who happen to be in your team or the weekly question, what are you gonna work on this week? That helps us coordinate and make those cross-cutting connections that people so romantically talk about, this is why we need the water cooler or, or otherwise how are you gonna get the serendipitous um, um, communications and connections created. Well, you can actually also create those online if you use the right kinds of uh, kinds of tools to do so. So, um, those are some of the ideas. All right, thank you so much on that. I think part part of what you said earlier with people having this forced experience, uh, a lot of them have um, come to mention work life balance, um, and I, I've noticed you have strong guardrails for that as I remember emailing with you uh, and the reason why this event is not our usual schedules because you had family obligations. So could you give people a few tips on how you protect your time um, while still being as efficient as you are running the company and also all, all the other activities that you do? Yes. So this was uh, actually one of the big themes in our latest book. It doesn't have to be crazy at work. Um, about creating that separation and, and being able to achieve and accomplish, not in spite of it, but because of it. People often look at um, these kinds of separations as though they put on boundaries or limits or ceilings in terms of your ambitions. And if you were just more ambitious and, and would work those 60 or 70 or 80 hours a week, you could accomplish so much more. Absolutely bullshit. You think we're not accomplishing enough? Um, you look at the history of Basecamp, the number of products we put out, the number of books we put out, the, the number of technology and open source we contributed to the greater ecosystem. I think anyone would be very hard pressed to say that we are not an ambitious company that is also highly productive. And I think we are highly productive exactly because we have these uh, core principles about um, how much time is enough, that 40 hours a week is enough, eight hours a day is enough that even if you work 80 hours a week, that only gives you twice the number of hours. If you squander your hours, that's wasted anyway. So why don't we focus on making the hours we already have, the eight hours a day, count for something more, which is where all of this integrates and kind of comes together in the sense that um, <clears throat> treating long stretches of uninterrupted time as a sacred KPI, if you will, to optimize, when was the last time you had three hours of uninterrupted time at work? When was the last time you had four hours? We've asked uh, a lot of people these questions in the past. They can't remember a single day because their days are so chopped up by meetings and interruptions that they never get more than 45 minutes here and an hour and a half there. And of course you can't get anything done if those are the meager apportionments of uh, attention you're granted at work. This is one of the reasons why I've hated the open office for so long, because it's absolutely an interruption factory. And it virtually guarantees that no one is able to stay in a zone of creativity for two, three, four hours at a time. And when I think back upon all the breakthroughs that we've done as a company, that I've done as a person, they all fall within that. 
they never come from a 45 minute slice. They come from getting enough time to dive deep into a problem and realize, oh, here's where it lays and then pushing through and, and solving it. Um, and the other side of that is to realize that the time spent away from work is not unproductive time. It is the kind of broadening of your human perspective that allows you to be a better person, which in turn allows you to be a better worker. You don't become a better uh, person just to become a better worker, but it's a consequence of it. And having sort of well-rested individuals who have other things going on in their life than just work, uh, I think creates this kind of broad perspective that makes you a better decision maker. It makes you more in touch with your with your customers and with your product and with your own time, what's worth doing and what's not worth doing. Um, it's funny that I often get the question, how do you get so much done? And I look at my day and like, I see many days, not always, but many days, I just see an empty calendar. And I go like, I don't feel like I'm stressed out. I don't feel like I'm doing that much, <laughs> but it really does accumulate when you just keep getting these long stretches of uninterrupted time and solve core problem one after the other it's not common for me to have a week where I look back upon that week on a Friday afternoon and think, actually, what did I get done? Um, what, what moved forward? In fact, if I do that, and it does happen occasionally, it's always a, a sort of course for, for, for great concern. But when I talk to other people, that's their life. This is what happens all the time. It's Friday afternoon and you look back upon your week and you think, actually, what did I what did I do? And I think not only is this unproductive, it's also a source of great stress and dissatisfaction and draining of meaning. The reason we go to work as creative professionals is because we want to create and progress um, and, and improve. And how can we do that if we're not actually moving anything forward? Um, so I think these things are intertwined and interlinked in the sense that if you are allowed the long stretches of uninterrupted time, if you're allowed the protections from interruptions and the freedom from pointless meetings, you will do more interesting work. And in turn, that interesting work will make you a happy, productive, um, satisfied worker and human. And like, isn't that what we're all trying to, to do and accomplish? Cool. This is this is uh, super interesting. Uh, I have the takeaway for ensuring long stretches of uninterrupted time and treating this also as a team KPI, as well for remote teams to meet every six months in person. H have you experimented with shorter or longer times between meeting in person and came to six months as a sweet spot? Yeah, I mean, we just experimented with two and a half years of not meeting each other. That <laughs> well, person. And, 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 that. <laughs> and the verdict is is very clear. That totally sucks. Don't do that. Um, yeah, I think part of it is just sort of the realism of we're being a global company. We have uh, people in Europe and Canada and South America and North America and all over the place. Um, traveling a week away from your family is... is is a sacrifice and you can't ask people to take that sacrifice lightly or all the time. So uh, every six months have felt like a natural way of doing it. Sometimes we've also added additional smaller team meetups in between that. But um, for us, we've just found that that cadence, we, we did it one time once a year and it felt like that was not enough. And then I think we did it one times, three times a year and that was too much. So um, every six months, at least for Basecamp has turned out to be the right cadence. Cool. Th thank you so much for this. Uh, we will try to apply it at product people as well because we, we are, have the same distributed first setup. So uh, we we have about eight minutes left. I'll I'll go to a question uh, about Basecamp and and hey, uh, we have to depending on time. Uh, do you plan offering EU hosted versions of these products so that the data doesn't leave the EU? This is I guess a follow up inspired by the yeah, GDPR I, I, discussion. I, I I think it's a great question. Uh, and it's funny because I'm sort of of two minds. On the one hand, I really want the streams to decision that's driving this question, um, the decision from the European Court of uh, Justice um, that was based on the complaint from streams to come to its full fruition. And it, it, in some, I don't know, maybe it's morbid sense, um, erect this great firewall or split so that the European companies have an advantage. Um, at the same time, 
for our business, obviously wouldn't actually be that great. <laughs> um, part of this is that the European setup is still quite nascent. Are we really better off if you just host your data on Amazon's European data center? Does that truly change anything? I'm not convinced at all that it does. What could change something was that we had um, more mature and full-featured European choices and alternatives to the like of AWS and, and other hosting services um, that could give a run for the money. But for us as an American company, um, I'm disappointed to say that at least mainland Europe is, or continental Europe is, is not actually a huge market for us. Um, so it, it doesn't make a lot of business sense at the moment for us to contemplate switching things over. Um, but I am personally interested in the fact that like this does become a little more difficult. I, I, I want to see some of the, it used to be a dirty word, but I don't know if it is anymore. Some of the protectionism that this can can invoke, because I do think that the European tech scene does need a little bit of protectionism for us to be able to develop our own national champions that can take on the large American tech companies. So I kind of have like two opposing views on it. Um, but uh, I, this is also what makes the interest or the question so interesting. And I think makes the future of this so interesting. We have all these uh, judgments from lower courts. There was just this latest thing was it out of Belgium saying, oh, Google Analytics is actually illegal. Um, what's fascinating about the US um, justice system is just how incredibly slow it moves. I think the original Shreem's complaint is from 2012 or something like that. It's taken like a decade for it to work its way through the system and it really still hasn't. Um, but I like kind of where it's going and, and um, we'll, we'll see where that comes to. But for us, no. Uh, Europe is, is not nearly large enough a, a market and we're not nearly large enough a company for us to contemplate the significant technical difficulty it would be to operate an entirely separate part of the business inside of the EU. And it wouldn't necessarily even offer any protection for the data. That's the other thing. So if you're an American company that's incorporated within the US and you have your data in Europe, you're still liable to produce that data under a national security letter or a subpoena or, or anything else like that, right? Um, now, I also think sometimes Europe does get on its high horse and then we get revelation after revelation showing how both the German um, intelligence service and the Danish intelligence service have been collaborating with the NSA to spy on <laughs> European citizens. And that kind of of course, spoils the moral high ground a little bit. So um, there's a bunch of stuff to to work out there. But um, yeah, I'm kind of morbidly interested to, to see how that happened. And, and I, I hope to some extent that something dramatic happens. I think our lives would be more interesting if they did. Although maybe right now, let's just sort of in, in the in the grand scheme of I, I, may your life be, may you live in interesting times as the Chinese proverb goes. I think our times right now are interesting enough. Maybe we can save this episode of uh, the great uh, American EU split on the internet for, for a later episode when things on other fronts are a little calmer. Absolutely agree with this. <laughs> um, all right, so a, a closing question. Um, what question would you have liked us to ask but didn't? Is this something you... Uh. <laughs> um, yeah, well, good question. Um, I, I really like all these topics. I like this sense that there is a developing European sensibility and sense of community that we have something that's different than just being part of this, um, trite idea of the global village, which the global village in terms of the internet being this sort of one connected unity mainly meant that we were all just suburbs of America. And I think it's time to have a more ambitious approach to European technology and European values and companies. And I'd, I'd like to see sort of more of that develop in a sense where we're not constantly looking across the pond thinking like, oh, why don't we have Silicon Valley? Why don't we have the VCs? Why don't we have this, that, and the other thing? and be thankful for the fact that we don't have those things in that configuration because then we would just get the cheap copies. And Europe has so much more to offer both intellectually and um, well, spiritually on, on so many of these topics. And 
I think the internet really needs that. The internet needs a much, much stronger Europe with um, European sensibilities and values being reflected in major international uh, services. And, and I'm really excited to see that it feels like we have the, the seeds in the ground for that. Well, thank you so much, uh, David. <clears throat> and um, we're very close to the end of our stream. A any closing thoughts from you? Um, yeah, I think that, I mean, thanks for having me. It, it's always a pleasure to talk about these issues. Uh, I apologize for my uh, uh, voice sounding like I, I smoke a, a 40 pack of, uh, of cigarettes every day. I, I, I assure you, I do not, just a, a bad cold, but uh, <laughs> um, all good. Yeah, thanks again for having me and, um, and for putting this on. Absolutely a pleasure. Uh, join us uh, next time uh, um, and hope to see you at our community events. We have one uh, streaming every, uh, Tuesday evening. We can find this on Meetup or LinkedIn. Uh, you can join our community on Telegram or support us on Patreon. And to not waste a, time, a moment to, for a plug, we are also hiring a product manager and, and a business development person. So th thanks again, David. And um, thank you all. Have a great day. Thanks. My pleasure. Bye.